I'm going to ask you all to turn in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. And I'm going to read the first eight verses from the book of Isaiah chapter 6. And for those of you that may not know it, this is the calling of Isaiah to be a prophet. And this is perhaps one of the most beautiful chapters other than Isaiah 53 in the book. A long time ago, I was reading through the book of Isaiah and just to give you a little background about why I came up with this message. Because um, I was sitting one day and I was reading through the book of Isaiah. And I was looking at the omniscience of God. That he knows all things. The omnipotence of God. That he's all powerful. And that he's omnipresent. But what I've also noticed in the book of Isaiah, not that how much God knows, but what I wrote down was, and it's a play on words, is how much God doesn't know. And you're probably shocked to even hear that, that there are things that God doesn't know. But I want you to pay very close attention to what I'm going to say, because it is a play on words. But it's going to make sense throughout our text. And I'm going to try to get through this in 30 minutes. But in Isaiah chapter 6, verse number 1, and I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. It says this, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. And with two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one cried to another, said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door was shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. One of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Also, I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. And as always, Lord, I want to just thank you first and foremost for allowing us this opportunity and also this privilege of being here in the house of God. Not only just come here to hear your word, but Lord, prayerfully to take into consideration what is being said and also applying your word to our lives. Lord, I want to thank you for just simply watching over each and every one of us last night and watching over our family, our children, our grandchildren, and perhaps some of us great grandkids. Lord, you've given us a day that was never promised to us. And you woke us up to your mercies that are new every single morning. Great is your faithfulness. So, Father, we pray that you would now give us ears so that we can hear what it is the Spirit has to say to the churches. And we ask this name in Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. 
What I've taken the liberty to do this morning is to write down four things that I believe that God does not know. In the book of Isaiah, Isaiah here in chapter 6 is called to be a prophet. It gives us the setting that this was immediately following the death of King Uzziah, perhaps one of the most notable kings after Solomon. And we know from the reading of scripture that King Uzziah was not only a king, but he inadvertently thought he was a priest as well. And he went to go offer a sacrifice and to do something that was not necessarily prescribed for the kings to do. And he got leprosy. But be that as it may, it was in this year that this vision or this calling was given to the prophet Isaiah. It was when King Uzziah had died. And it says that he saw the Lord Adonai, which it is in the original language. He was sitting on a throne. He was high and lifted up. And it also indicated that the train of the Lord's robe had filled the temple. Now what that's essentially is, is say, saying to us is that whenever we would see the train of a king, or some of you perhaps even remember the, uh, the wedding ceremony of, of Diana and how long her train was. And back in these days, depending on the length of the train of the robe, it would actually indicate the power and the prestige of the king. And it, it, it says here that the train of the robe of Adonai had filled the entire temple. And it also tells us in verse number two about the seraphims that stood and each one had six wings. With two it covered his face and with two it covered his feet and also with two they flew and they cried out, separate. Separate, separate, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And obviously this is not talking about the times of Jesus Christ. This is looking far into the future because it says that the whole earth will one day be filled with the glory of God. And this is obviously looking into the future. But I want to mention these four things that I believe that God does not know as we continue to look through our text. And as we look in verse number four, the post of the door was shaken by the voice of him who cried out and the house was filled with smoke. And in verse number five, he says, woe is me. The prophet says, I am undone because I'm a man of unclean lips. One of the things I want to say to encourage each and every one of us, Paul said this to the church in Philippi. He said that technically we're all still under construction. In other words, he that has begun a good work in us is faithful to complete it until the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And with that being said, that the prophet saw himself undone after he saw the glory of God. But I want to say this, and here is the first thing that I believe that God does not know. God does not know a sin he doesn't hate. God does not know a sin he doesn't hate. He, Jesus Christ, became sin. For us, he knew no sin, but he became sin for us that you and I may become the righteousness of God through him. But it's not until we can see ourselves as sinners that we can see the full glory of God and who he is. You remember Peter when he saw the full essence of Jesus Christ. He said, away from me. I'm, I'm a man, I'm an unclean man, in other words, and I'm just paraphrasing, that he saw himself for who he really was, but he didn't see himself for who he really was until he saw the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to go real quick to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 33. 
And remember what I said. God doesn't know a sin. He doesn't hate. Here's the second thing that God does not know. Number two, God does not know a sinner he doesn't love. God does not know a sinner he doesn't love. It says in Ezekiel, in verse number 8 of Ezekiel chapter 33, and here it talks about the watchman and his message. And in verse number 8 of Ezekiel chapter 33, when I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that the wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Therefore, you, O son of man, say to the house of Israel, Thus you say, If our transgressions and our sins lie upon us, and we pine away in them, how can we then live? Listen to this, men. Say to them, as I live, and this is the Lord talking to the prophet Ezekiel, I have no pleasure. Listen to this. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. In other words, God does not glory over the death of wicked people like perhaps some of us may do. And I'm not in any way, shape, or form accusing you all of doing this, but the Bible makes it clear that God has no pleasure in the death of wicked people. Why? Because that's something God doesn't know. God doesn't know a sinner that he doesn't love. Because when Jesus Christ came to this earth, the Bible says, and many of us know this passage by heart, in the 16th verse of John chapter 3, God loved the world so much. And what's interesting about the term world, this world that you and I live in, when Jesus came to this earth, when God sent his son, this was not a lovable place. It wasn't that God saw lovable people and decided, that he's going to send his son. It was an unlovable world. But because God loved us so much, he sent his son to die on the cross for the sins of the whole world. Why? Because it goes back to this passage that God does not have pleasure in the death of wicked, sinful people. And that's something that God doesn't know. God doesn't know a sinner he doesn't love because Jesus Christ came to this earth not to condemn sinners, but to save sinners. Amen? Amen? Yeah. It says here that he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked should turn from his way and live. He says, turn, turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? Why should you die that God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And if God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, then God doesn't know a sinner he doesn't love. God loves all people. But all people have to make a conscious decision to accept the free gift of salvation that has been given to the whole world in Jesus Christ. He did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but that the world through him might be saved. So God doesn't know a sin he doesn't hate. God hates sin so much that he did have to send his son because it was you and I sins that separated us from God. God hates sin. You know what is interesting is that if I was the only person on the face of this planet, let's just say I was the only person living on this whole globe, did you know that God would have still had to send Jesus Christ to die for me? Why? Because I'm a sinner. But you and I are now sinners that have been saved by the unmerited favor of Almighty God. That's grace. 
And as Pastor Chuck used to say, grace changes everything. It does. That's giving us what we don't deserve because God doesn't know a sinner he doesn't love. When you go back to the book of Isaiah and it says, Woe is me for I am undone. Isaiah saw himself as what? A sinner. He saw himself that way. But God didn't call Isaiah because he was qualified. God qualified him when he called him. Why? He doesn't know a sinner he doesn't love. Here's something else that God does not know. All right? God does not know another way to get us to heaven but through Jesus Christ. He doesn't know another way. It's not that he knew another way and chose not to do it. God doesn't know another way to get us to heaven but through his son, Jesus Christ. In the book of John, remember what he said there in John chapter 14 when Jesus was speaking to his disciples and he said to them that I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I go, there you may be also. And what did Thomas do? Thomas says, hold, hold it. Hold it. I don't, we don't know where you're going. And could you please show us the way? You know, I like Thomas. A lot of people call him Doubting Thomas, but Thomas reminds me of the guy that like in classroom when the teacher asks you a question and she goes, does everybody understand? And then you have the bobblehead people in the classroom that says, oh, we all understand. Thomas is that guy that says, I don't get it, right? And then when he says, I don't get it or I don't know the way, everybody else is saying, thank God he asked that question. Yeah. yeah. Thank God he just said that because most of us don't get it. But God doesn't know another way to get us to heaven but through Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. And nobody, no one, no one includes everybody and it excludes nobody. No one. Or get to heaven, but through me. Why? Because God does not know another way to get us to heaven, but through his son, Jesus Christ. Now notice what it says here in the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. Not only did he see himself as undone, he saw everybody else as undone. He says, I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. However, my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim, they flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongues from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity, your sins has been taken away and they have been purged. And that has been done. For us, through Jesus Christ. You know, when you and I get to heaven, God can't hold us responsible for our sins. Did you know that? When we get to heaven, he can't hold us responsible for being sinners. You know why? Because his son has paid it all. His son's death and resurrection has paid for our sins. So when we get there, God sees us through the finished work right now of Jesus Christ. Why? Because God does not have any other way to get us to heaven but through Jesus Christ. He doesn't know another way. Here's something else I want us to take into consideration. In verse number 8, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who's going to go for us? And then he said, here am I. Send me. Now here's your challenge. Here's the fourth thing that God doesn't know. God does not know another way to get the gospel message out but through you and me. The heavens declare the glory of God. 
But Jesus had to choose 11 disciples to go into all the world and preach what? The gospel. Because God did not know another way to get the message out but through you and I. Who am I to go and do this? Once again, God doesn't select those who have been called. God calls us and then he sends us to go into the world. That's why I mentioned about the homes being built over there. Because I'm sure if you men don't go knock on those doors, trust me, there'll be other cults doing it. That's why God has chosen you and me to take the message of the gospel to a lost and dying world. He knows no other way to get that message out but through human beings such as you and I. And we don't have to go knock on those doors. We get to go knock on those doors. It's an opportunity and a privilege that God has allowed us to give his message out to a lost and dying world. And if God doesn't know a sin, he doesn't hate. And if he doesn't know a sinner, he doesn't love. And if he does not know another way to get us to heaven but through Jesus Christ, and he doesn't know another way to send the gospel out by you and me, there's one thing that we do know that God does not know is God cannot what? Lie. He doesn't know how to lie. And if God doesn't know how to lie, guess what? That means this must be what? True. <laughs> there you go. By process of elimination because God does not know how to lie. That means this word that is his has to be true. So as we look at Scripture, and as we allow Scripture to speak into our hearts and in our lives, man, I want to encourage you, as I like to encourage myself, as I sat out there eating that wonderful breakfast, that is such a privilege and an honor that God has chosen us to do what he's called us to do. Well, Ty, you know, I work long days, I get home, and I hear this from people, and I say, time out, time out. If God loved you so much that he sacrificed his only begotten son, and he's asked you to take his message and spread it to those that may not know about Jesus Christ, how much more should you and I be indebted to do what God has called us to do? I don't know about you, but I only have one regret in life as a Christian, and I say this all the time, is that the only regret that I have is that I wish I had a chosen Jesus Christ a lot sooner. That's the only regret I have. Thank God I'm saved today. Because I know that the best is yet to come. And this is not my home. We're pilgrims, guys. We're getting ready to go home. All right? We're getting ready to go home. Don't pitch a tent here. <laughs> We're getting ready to go home. And if those things in which God doesn't know and God can't lie, let's hold on to those truths because we know we know that we serve a God who loves us, who's given himself for us. And one day, we'll see him face to face. Let's bow in prayer. Father God, this morning, we want to thank you for these simple truths. We thank you once again for even the air that we breathe. I pray that each day as we awaken to another day, that, Lord, we would just simply set aside time to say thank you for all that you do in our lives. Father, I just want to pray, not only just for these men, but I pray for myself. Keep us faithful. Keep us steadfast. 
continue to give us a love and a desire for God's word. Keep us in prayer. And we would say, as Paul said to the church in Thessalonica, that we would just learn how to pray without ceasing. I pray that you would keep us in the house of God, the church, the body of believers. And above all else, help us and teach us how to take this gospel message into a lost and dying world. We thank you for your goodness. And as we leave now, we go our separate ways. I pray that you would just simply watch over each and every one of us. Please, God, don't allow any hurt, any harm or danger to come up on us, our wives, our children, our grandbabies. Lord, keep us safe. And if it be thy will that you would just wake us up tomorrow to your mercies that are new every single morning. That may the words of our mouths the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength, our redeemer, our savior, our king. We ask it in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you, Beaumont. <clears throat> Thank you.